I will say he, he is very good at his job. He's very good at like subtly pushing a narrative while simultaneously acting like he's totally above that and maintains the veneer of like objective journalism. I mean, should we just watch it? Should we just watch the whole thing? I mean, this one was probably the, uh, one of the best parts of the entire, uh, entire combo. I posted on my Instagram as well. Violence okay, required for its maintenance. Okay, listen. And that violence is frustrating people. I hear that you. That violence I is radicalizing you. people. But here's Hold my, on. I hear as you. far as Israel, as far as, it, as far as what Benjamin Netanyahu has done, as far as the war government, what they have done, peers, going into Gaza yeah. and bombing Gaza and killing 3,480 uh, Palestinians so far in Gaza, 1,000 plus children out of all of those casualties, 22 hospitals being bombed, a bakery, the only remaining intact bakery being bombed yesterday. Um, these are these are horrifying crimes that you would openly say are horrifying and unjustifiable when Russia does it, but when Israel does it, it Israel has a right to defend itself. This is identical to the same talking points that I've heard from every Israeli administration official. It's the same talking points that I've heard from American politicians championing the, the exact same talking points. It's the same thing that I've heard from everyone else in the media. You might have been against the Iraq uh, war and, and you use that, but you're using that for, for evil, in my opinion, at this point. If you are not sitting here and condemning those acts of war crimes, those acts of violence, that, those acts of collective punishment. Yeah, uh, I cooked his ass a little bit there uh, at the end of it. I mean, he was very he was very frustrated by like the whole uh, propaganda stuff. I don't know why he fucking cared about it so goddamn much. That was like his main point of contention. It seems it, it seemed like that was the only thing he gave a shit about. But overall, you know, um, I uh, here let's just let me just pull it up. I don't know how to. Find the me calling myself a propagandist is like, I, I just, I don't really care personally about like being called a propagandist. I don't care about it because I think it's like, you know, everyone is doing propaganda. That's like, like I'm more of a, I, I understand the definition, the dictionary definition of propaganda. Uh, but people always uh, make additional negative assertions where it's like, it's a bad thing. Propaganda is a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. It's like, no, it's just like someone who is loudly and proudly advocating for a cause. It doesn't mean that you spread misinformation or lie. You can do that and that would be bad and wrong. So why'd you use this as a propagandist as an insult to him? Because when he does it, he's doing it for a direction that he, uh, that he, he hides behind the, the banner of independent journalism. I don't have a problem with uh, being called a propagandist or, or saying that I am a propagandist or the, uh, the concept of propaganda in general. The issue is when you are doing propaganda and you are uh, not uh, you know, making honest assessments, making dishonest assessments oftentimes, or the, the uh, objective truth that you claim that you care about, okay? And then you, you act like uh, one side, uh, you, you only offer coverage and condolences to one side's, ma uh, one side's dead, uh, the casualties on one side and you you justify it uh, for the other side which is of course the Palestinian side like yeah you're doing you're a bad propagandist and you are hiding your uh, own personal bias in the matter I'm also not a journalist like I this is not to hide behind it uh, the the whole like I'm a dumb himbo shit like I get that I I know that I have a responsibility in my mind that I I want to ensure that you are all perfectly informed and you are not led astray, that you are not misinformed, okay? And I'm going to give you every aspect of a story and then tell you what my perspective is, which is what I do. I give you uh, IDF sources. I tell you if I don't believe it. I tell you if there's a likelihood that those sources are valid. I give you on the ground reporting from OSINT Andes, some of which are fucking literally CIA cutouts anyway, and, and forensic, uh, forensic analysts, and I talk to them behind the scenes as well. It's just, it's not a, a one-sided affair in the way that people try to present it. I am biased in the direction of the emancipation for Palestinian people, as I've said, but that does not mean that I'm going to misinform you willingly, deliberately, and obfuscate the truth, um, just like immediately after uh, the, the 
rubble was cleared or when there was a, a little bit of daylight shed on the, the impact crater from the Al-Ahli hospital, uh, I, with the new information, not with what Israel had said, not with what Israel claimed, but with the newfound information, I told you that my assessment is a little bit different. Uh, of course, I still believe that until there is a third party investigation, that yes, I still believe that the, the, the relentless bombing campaign is, is still happening uh, by Israeli hands, okay? And I also don't believe that like, in a situation where Israel has killed more than a thousand children, where they turn around and go, yeah, but like 30 of them, or uh, 30 of those children, or 500 uh, uh, of those casualties in total from the 3,480 thus far, uh, were, were actually Hamas militants like blowing themselves up. I'm like, okay, that's still fucked up. Like that's still fucked up, but what's the argument? That like when you kill Palestinians, it's okay. But when, uh, you know, there's a, there's a misfire, then all of a sudden that's the, the worst kind of uh, killing of Palestinians. Like they're still dying. They're still dying just like Israelis died. You know what I mean? This is like unacceptable. It, it's ridiculous. The more interesting aspect of this was like what I covered already, for example, and I'll use this example really quickly. If you remember, Israel has the Hannibal Protocol, right? Where if they have a hostage situation, they go guns blazing. Like, and sometimes they might actually end up killing the hostage. Uh, they claim that they don't, it's not official policy anymore, okay? But uh, one of the, uh, one of the, the uh, members uh, that survived the, the massacre at the kibbutz uh, went on Israeli public radio I think state radio, as a matter of fact, and said that most of the people died in the crossfire when the IDF came in and uh, were, went in guns blazing. Now, does this mean that, like, you have to have scrutiny for the death toll? Does this mean that it's, like, IDF's fault? No. In that circumstance, absolutely not. They went in there, guns blazing, because, because Hamas was there, because they, they had, they, they had uh, hostages. Like, it, it's ridiculous to, to... And I said it back then. I said... Look, ultimately, it doesn't matter because these people still died. They still died, and it was horrifying. And it's not like the IDF would be there. Uh, it, it, Palestinian forces were not in that kibbutz. So it doesn't really change anything uh, in the grand scheme of things. So while I still do maintain the position that uh, until I get third-party clarification uh, or, or some additional smoking gun, some additional smoking gun... Uh, evidence that uh, we have yet to see, right? That is uh, pretty conclusive. I am still going to assume that the bombing campaign is being conducted by the guys who have been doing the bombing campaign. You know what I mean? I don't know why you would assume, or that I would assume, I would make the assertion that like, the guys that already blew up that hospital, that like blew up the cancer ward with the artillery shell two days prior are not responsible for the upcoming bombing potentially. Anyway, so in the, uh, in this kind of a situation, uh, uh, you know, I, I still have to rely on on the ground reporting. It's not like I'm making my own shit up. And I think that the media assessment overall, uh, assuming that it was Israel, was perfectly valid. And I feel crazy that they like had to go back and be like, I'm so sorry for saying that. And they've been getting yelled at non fucking stop. While it's not like Israel has stopped its bombing campaigns, they, they've kept it up. And for people who try to point to, yeah, they fucking blew up the courtyard of a church. Like there's a massive church complex and they blew up the courtyard like literally last night or two nights ago. I don't even know. My fucking days and, and nights are so, they're all mashed into one another. So I might get something wrong here, but ultimately it, it blows my mind that I want, I want the truth. Number one, I want the truth. I want the truth of what happened at the Al-Ahli hospital. Okay. But this does not change my perspective on what has been going on and what has happened since. Okay? Of course, like, I still think that uh, the, the gruesome bombing campaign conducted by Israel is completely unacceptable. Okay? It's just completely ridiculous. Anyway, so, yeah. Yeah, Justin Amash's fucking relatives died, dude. That's nuts. Like, uh, a, an American uh, libertarian... Are you realistic? How do you have 20k viewers? Holy crap. Have you seen what Hamas and Palestinian people murdered kids and families in the kibbutz? Have you not seen the videos? You have zero clue what happened. Literally zero stream something else. You're sitting in Vegas with zero knowledge. Widedo. Yeah, dude. You got it. I, I, I was totally oblivious to this. Like, fucking idiot. Of course I know that. I just brought it up earlier. 
the fuck is wrong with you? The obfuscation and the lack of clarity in the hospital bombing at this point is media narratives. It's media narratives and it's important to, to arrive at the truth regardless. It's important to make an assessment on every single casualty, every single death, no matter who is responsible for it, okay? Oh shit, my food is here. All right, hold on. Here, let's start with the Piers Morgan. Well, now the Battle of the Hearts and Minds, traditionally played out through diplomacy and propaganda, is being played out online. My next guest has almost half a billion views for his provocative commentary online, making him hugely influential. Hassan Piker streams live under the name Hassan Abi. His analysis of the Israel-Hamas war has taken a highly critical stance towards Israel and Western media, and he's been calling me out for my coverage. Because he only cares about Israeli citizens. He does not care about Palestinians as human beings. That's why it's apples to oranges. It's like one side is a human, the other side is a barbaric monster child. I never said that, obviously. Uh, he says that he'd like nothing more than to come on to Uncensored and call me a baboon in a suit to my face. Well, here I am, a baboon, uh, and he can join me now. Uh, I'm joined by Hassan. Hassan, thank you very much, David, for coming on. Thank you for having me, Piers. Uh, it's very early here in Los Angeles, California. But I'm going to try to do my very best to, to not do my British accent while I'm here. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And listen, I appreciate you coming on. Explain to me why you consider me a stenographer for the Israeli government, given that in the last week, I think more than any other host in the world, I have given lengthy platforms to pro-Palestinian voices to articulate that side of the argument. So I want no, I, I, I do have to commend you. <coughs> I, I will. I tried to immediately I tried to immediately cut in here and just like glaze him up a little bit because I think he does deserve glazing. OK, I don't think it's like uh, unfair to make this assessment. Uh, I, I think that he has brought up a lot of uh, pro Palestinian voices a lot more than anyone else. Now, has he done it to fucking get owned? Has he done it for, uh, you, you know, clout reasons, right? I don't know. But it doesn't matter because what matters is those voices get heard and those voices rarely ever get heard in mainstream media. So I think that it's a good thing and he deserves, I guess, some praise for it. So yeah, had to give him his flowers there, I guess. Uh, you certainly have uh, had more pro-Palestinian voices than uh, the rest of the British media and certainly the rest of uh, Western media in general. Now, as far as uh, uh, saying that you're a stenographer, I said that journalists are not supposed to be stenographers, and yet when it comes down to it, in most circumstances, in whatever conflict uh, we may be in, there are stenographers for whichever uh, whichever party is aligning with the American State Department and the interests of the West in general. And Israel happens to be the one uh, in this in this ongoing conflict. But it's interesting that you... I didn't want to just say, like, you know, you just say whatever Israel tells you. Because I feel like that can come across, like, that can be used as, like, anti-Semitic. I don't think it is anti-Semitic to say that. But I think in a situation like this, I'm trying to be as 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 cordial and as like clear and coherent with my message as possible. It's I think years and years and years of being fucking clip chimped have like basically prepared me to ensure that I'm it, it might come across as like long winded, but I want to make sure that you can't clip something that just comes across as not what I actually meant and can be used against me or more importantly, use against the people that I care about use against like the Palestinian claw uh, cause like these are things that I am afraid of always call me a propagandist because I want to play you this was your reaction to when the hospital got I'm bombed. a propagandist well, no, no, for the record I'm, no no I'm not calling I'm you a propagandist. that I'm just, no, no, I'm just saying I'm gonna no, play I'm saying, you I'm saying I am okay well then I want to I'm play saying it. I am I just want to play, play it okay I'm gonna play the clip this is your reaction to the bombing of the hospital uh, the other night while I was in the process of, of getting ready for the stream, uh, Israel enacted uh, one of the singular worst strikes they have done thus far. And an airstrike, an Israeli airstrike, hit the Al Ahli hospital in Gaza City, where thousands of civilians were seeking medical treatment and shelter from the relentless bombing campaign. Now, interestingly, when, that, when you were saying that, uh, I was coming on air too. And I took a position uh, based probably on 30 years of being a journalist, running major newspapers, working at CNN and others. 
I like that this guy is also like, look at my bona fides as like a major journalist. And it's like, bro, you literally hacked into like famous people's phones and shit. Like, isn't he? He's like a paparazzi guy, isn't he? British media, man. I gotta hand it to him though. He is a clever dog. I mean, he, he's sly, he's slick with it. I will say, he, he is like very good at his job. Like, he's very good at like subtly pushing a narrative while simultaneously acting like he's totally above that and maintains the, uh, maintains the veneer of like objective journalism. Uh, of waiting. I'm just saying, I think we should just wait and see what has actually happened here, get clarification, see who's actually to blame before we start passing judgment. You raced in to assume, as many people did, by the way, including the New York Times, BBC, mainstream media, uh, and of course, most of the Arab world uh, then followed, that this was clearly, uh, indisputably, an Israeli airstrike or missile. So the other part of this that I'm frustrated by is when shameless people, Piers doesn't do it as aggressively, but shameless people online will go, hey, you fucked up. 100% conclusively proven that this was not an Israeli airstrike actually. So you fucked up on that. And you caused all these Muslims to get angry. And now they're like, you know, trying to burn embassies. And it's really interesting because like, you think that is the only fucking reason? Like everyone was perfectly chill with 1,000 dead Palestinian children, 3,480 Palestinians murdered by Israeli airstrikes. But then the hospital, that's it? That's the, that's the reason why everybody fucking got mad. No, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. That doesn't mean that there wasn't anything else going on. Of course people were fucking frustrated. It's not like they're not protesting now. They still are. You think it's only the, the fucking, uh, the al Ahli hospital? That's the reason? It's crazy. So there's two fronts here that I'm frustrated by. One, people that say, oh, well, it's not certain. It's not certain. And then like, and then subtly making it seem like uh, the, the line of defense that was adopted by the IDF needs to be taken uh, at its word, even though the IDF time and time again has very openly lied to the media about this kind of thing. This exact same thing. They've lied about different bombing campaigns where they were responsible, but then they shot to shift the blame over to Islamic Jihad. They've lied about assassinations by sniper rifle and then tried to shift the responsibility over to uh, uh, the, the Palestinian brigades in Janine, and then slowly had to retract both of those without even punishing the people responsible, by the way, because it's not even fucking illegal in their, on their minds. It's hospital. And yet all the evidence now suggests very strongly that it wasn't, that in fact, this was a rocket that misfired coming from a, a, a terrorist go group inside Gaza. So my question for you is this. Why would, why would you I wouldn't be, go that far, Why Pierre. would you... Yeah, he thought he was going to bully me and be like, see, you were wrong. I was like, what are you talking about? Are you out of your mind? What are you talking about? Just this, this idea that like, oh no, it's, it's done. All evidence points to this not being Israeli. It's like, really? Does it? Why do you ne never get punished for immediately repeating whatever the fuck the IDF has said? How does that work? Well, I know why, because that's, you know, that's our ally. Even if they sometimes lie to us, it's fine. For those of you watching, in my opinion, this was probably the worst part of the interview. He was cutting me off quite a lot. And he was like pumping me with these clips to drive home a narrative that I'm a dishonest, uh, I'm a misinformation merchant. But I think I did a decent job overall uh, with, with given, the, uh, given the limitations that I had. I mean, obviously it's like early in the morning, I'm like not awake yet, but that's not the main problem here. The main problem is that like, um, I can't really say anything. He just like would, uh, you'll see multiple times. I'm like trying to cu cut in and trying to interrupt and he would just boulder over it. Would you be so certain in, in what you said before you knew? Okay, so first and foremost, before we get started on this conversation, let's understand something very important here. There's no electricity in Gaza. Internet is patchy in Gaza. There's no food in Gaza. There's no water in Gaza. This is all by design. This is because Gaza is under a brutal blockade, a brutal occupation by the Israeli government. Okay? So that, it, that plays a role in the fog of war and the misinformation that gets spread. Having said that, however, uh, you, uh, 
you made it seem as though there is a certainty that this was 100% uh, not an Israeli airstrike. No, I didn't. I didn't. And instead, I literally just said. I literally just said it, it's not a certainty. You, okay, sorry. I said I, the, I, evidence, I the evidence is then increasingly pointing to this not being an Israeli airstrike, and that is expert evidence okay, from people that, who have no skin in the game at all. Yes. Uh, well. I don't know which expert you're, uh, you're talking about, because I think Channel 4 did a pretty good job. As a matter of fact, I would say Channel 4 did probably the best job so far in analyzing everything that the IDF has said. But the reason why I believed, and I still do believe, that the likelihood is that this was an Israeli bombing campaign wasn't only because of the singular verifiable video, the, the phone video from the balcony that uh, had all of the markings of an airstrike. The fact that the Israeli Air Force was enacting a bombing campaign in the region at the time. He did not say that. He, in fact, said a terrorist rocket. Yeah, I I mean, dude, dude, I, I didn't pick that up. But this is what I mean. That's why I said he's a pretty you good fucking... You made it seem as though there is a certainty that this was 100% uh, not an Israeli airstrike. No, I didn't. I didn't. And instead, I literally just uh, said... I literally just said it, it's not a certainty. You, okay, sorry. I said I, the, I, evidence, I the evidence is then increasingly pointing to this not being an Israeli airstrike. All the evidence now suggests very strongly that it wasn't. That, in fact, this was a rocket that misfired coming from a, a, a terrorist go group inside Gaza. So All right, let's do it. That's crazy. I didn't even realize that until like literally today. I, thank you, Austin Ox, for catching that shit. I like that beat. I didn't even realize what was in it. Here you go, blasting it off. From a, a, a See, I wasn't quick on my fucking toes, man. He caught me slipping there. That's kind of fucked up. Anyway, let's keep going. Time according to the Al Jazeera live streaming footage that everyone is using but doesn't understand. Uh, the fact that uh, the, the uh, digital media person uh, for the IDF uh, immediately came out and, and said that this was actually a, an airstrike that hit a Hamas target and that he was sad that there were, you know, uh, casualties at the end of the day, but this... This uh, was a Hamas target and celebrated it. And more importantly, I guess, the fact that this hospital had been bombed by Israel. Mm. This hospital had been bombed by Israel on Saturday. 22 hospitals have, as a matter of fact, been bombed by Israel since this last uh, saga in the occupation. And this hospital had been bombed directly by Israel where the cancer ward was destroyed. Israel has been bombing all of these hospitals. Israel has been calling all of these hospitals to evacuate over and over and over again. The medical professionals at the hospital had been called by the Israeli government uh, the day prior. And everyone on the ground assumes that this is an Israeli airstrike. They are the ones who experienced the, uh, the situation. Listen, so when you have, when you have but the every truth single... Is, can I the just truth is, if you watch the BBC, this? If you watch the I, BBC I, account of all this last night, by their Verify unit, which was specifically set up by the BBC to be completely dispassionate in these investigations. And they reached a pretty clear conclusion based on circumstantial evidence, I'll make that clear, that this would not have been an Israeli airstrike, including, for example, the size of the crater, which bears no relation to the size of craters normally left yes. by Israeli So, So this part sucks because it's like, I agree. The size of the crater is inconsistent with the fucking JDAM. And he knows I agree with him on that. So he's bringing that up. But it's like, but that still doesn't change. Israel has a fucking incredibly diverse array of munitions that they fucking dump into Gaza and elsewhere. So it's, it's very frustrating to just like drop that in there. And I can't even fucking describe it to him and be like, listen, dude, um, I get that. But there's still plenty of information that is inconsistent uh, with respect to like what the IDF has brought up. They're not a credible actor in this circumstance. And I think one thing that I will always say and always will push, and I've been saying it since day one, if you remember, I said the likelihood is that this is an Israeli airstrike or some kind of Israeli bomb. However, I can be, of course, uh, wrong. What did I say day one? I said, if there's a third party investigation, like from the UN, International Criminal Court, and they find conclusive evidence that this was not a uh, Israeli rocket or Israeli bomb or Israeli artillery, but instead a Hamas rocket that misfired, then yeah, I, I, I'm wrong. This does not change 
the 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 direction or the reality on the ground. Yeah, I'm wrong in that situation if that is the case. However, what has happened since then? Like a thousand more people have fucking been murdered since then. Like what are we talking about? Anyway, Evan Hill had a Evan Hill highlighted this uh, this this uh, forensic architecture uh, thread that we're going to be looking at. That, in my opinion, did a pretty decent job of like analyzing where the artillery possibly came from, and also the uh, the the Doppler effect, like the sound forensics as well. Looking at like what direction the missile or the whatever the the object was, uh, what direction it came from. These are important things to analyze as well. These these are. Audio analysis is, is genuinely important and, and uh, unfortunately it's been devoid of this uh, commentary thus far. So we'll, we'll look at all of that. But my point here is that this is a very frustrating conversation to have with someone who claims that they're not one-sided on it, but is literally one-sided. Difference is, not only do I admit that I'm biased, okay? I admit that I'm biased. I'm biased on behalf of Palestinian emancipation. I'm, I, I'm a firm believer that Palestinian emancipation will be the most effective way to ensure permanent security for Israelis as well. The inverse has been demonstrably a failure. Anyway, my point is, yeah, apartheid doesn't work. This will, this would literally uh, make the situation better and, and create a more livable circumstance for everybody there. But of course I will continue assuming and I think it's not unjustifiable to make this assumption considering how many fucking places they've bombed since then that this was the, the, the responsibilities bared upon uh, Israel until there's evidence that is conclusive that shows me that it's not. But look, my point is neither of us know for sure. But you took to your airwaves immediately because actually you're, I wouldn't even say unconscious bias, you're admitted propagandist bias on your part was that you wanted that to be an Israeli airstrike. It suited your narrative. And I would say that that in itself, in its I way, it to be is an being a stenographer. Well, you know, you accuse me no, of being putting, a stenographer. You're putting I try and be mouth. fair and get to the truth. Yeah, I wanted it to be Israeli airstrike. It's an insane thing to say. Brother, I don't want any airstrike. The notion that he's like such a good objective little journalist and then says, you wanted it to be an Israeli airstrike. Like, you're fucking nuts, dude. That is an incredibly dishonest thing to say. But because he's blasting me from eight different avenues, I can't even fucking hit him on all of the targets. In your case, I don't think mm -hmm. you try to do that. I think you appeal to your audience, appeal to your base, this and you don't really care whether the facts are there or not. This is entirely unfair, because you just said circumstantial evidence favors that this was not an Israeli airstrike. Yeah. I gave you all of the circumstantial evidence that it does favor that this is an Israeli airstrike. The reason why, however, circumstantial evidence is not enough. And the one thing that I will concede to, because when more information did come out, and no, I do not mean when Israel said that they did not bomb this hospital and it was actually Hamas. And then they turned around and went, never mind, it's not Hamas, it's actually Islamic Jihad. And then they said, we have more evidence coming out in a couple hours. And then the evidence came out and it turns out it sounded like uh, it, it, the, the phone conversations that they were able to intercept supposedly uh, sounded like... Uh, 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 by experts at the very least uh, to be uh, completely false and, and uh, completely uh, made up. Yeah, but Hassan, I don't accent, think, I, listen, in all, all honesty, now, I now, don't wait, think, wait, even on, as you're saying on, all this, finish. I think you're a smart guy. Piers, let me finish. I think you've looked at all of this and I think in your heart, you know this was probably not. He's just like, he's like, oh, in your heart, you knew it was uh, not Israel. You knew it was Palestine. Like, that's a, insane. That's not how you do a conversation, bro. Not an Israeli airstrike. And I'm just curious why that's, you would, instead of admitting no, that as facts no, change, that is your not what I'm changed. saying. That no, is not what I'm saying at all. I don't all. understand why you would Please. double and treble you, down you, when the evidence is pointing show. the other you're way. You're asking me to be on your show. Do you want to talk? Yes. You, you, if you're asking me to be on your show, and I want to be on the show, thank you so much for having me on your yeah. show, let me explain exactly what I said. And let me explain to you why I think still to this very moment, until there is a third party investigation that is concluded by uh, the UN, the International Criminal Court, or specifically a forensic analyst that, uh, that looks at the situation is allowed to be on the ground. This is not just my perspective, this is Beth Selim as well, which is an Israeli organization that has also demanded a okay. third party investigation occur. I am not going to. I am not going to conclusively say that this was not. I don't Israel's expect you to. Fault. 
I'm Why? Don't you. Because I just gave you, because I, and not because I'm a propagandist. As far as me being a propagandist goes, everyone is a propagandist. I'm just honest about it. You're a propagandist. We have our I'm biases. I'm curious who you think I'm I a propagandist for. I am at least honest for. about my bias. Who do you think I'm a propagandist for? Who do I think you're a propagandist yeah. for? Yeah. Whichever you're, every, every media person is, is doing propaganda. This yeah, but, is, who, is, but who for? Just, I've fact. got to be doing it, it with somebody. You think it's a bad word? I don't. That's just the difference. This, this is a I do. I think it's actually quite a serious charge. Hassan, I think it's a serious charge to level, not as a podcaster, but as a journalist who's broadcasting around the world, who has a reputation, I believe, for being fair and impartial, actually, on these issues. This is so funny because he doesn't. Like, who the fuck thinks he's like a serious journalist? British people don't like him. It's interesting because, like, the Tories don't really like him either, right? I've never actually met a single person, whether they're from England or any other part of the world, that was like, I'm a big Piers Morgan fan. Yeah. Also, he's a propagandist. He's a, he is, he is a propagandizing for Israel. He'll make tiny slivers of criticism here and there, but then ultimately, he takes whatever the fuck they say, hook, line, and sinker, and repeat it. One of the greatest examples of this is that he cannot condemn the, the, the thousands of people that Israel has killed in this last siege, okay? He can't do it. That's why he always runs away from it. He goes, oh, well, it's more about proportion. It's more about proportion, which is why ba Bassam did a really good job when he was like, how many babies? How many babies can be killed? What's the, what's the baby to grandma uh, equation? What's the, what's the index here? Explain it to me. He was right. Pierce can't respond to that because he's a fucking propagandist. Jeez. It's quite a charge to just say, I'm a stenographer of the Israeli government or I'm a propagandist. I don't think there's any evidence I'm either of those things. I'm curious who you think I'm doing the propaganda While we're having this conversation, 3,000... Piers, while we're having this back and forth, 3,840 Palestinians have been ruthlessly slaughtered in the last incursion into Gaza. I feel like this is an incredibly selfish, self-centered conversation to have. You asked me to be on here. You wanted, you wanted to hear my perspective. I'm willing to give it to you. I don't want to talk about like whether the, I don't want to talk about Noam Chomsky style manufacturing okay. consent conversations okay. about how the media is operating listen, in, the, I, in the, listen, uh, the behest of capital. You were the guy, listen, I think you were the guy that called me. There are dead people. Listen, Hassan, I only asked you because you're the guy that called me a propagandist and called me a baboon in the soup. I was curious as to why. You don't want to say I who, know, I'm, but, who I'm but doing I, the propaganda for. We'll move on, we'll move on. I agree with I you. Said you. I said, there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture here. Let's move I on. Said that let's take a short you, break. Hassan, let's take a short break. I want to come okay. back. I want to talk to you about what happened on October the 7th. Get your reaction to that. Welcome back, Hassan Piker. Is By the end of it, he was like, I think he didn't give me any breathing room on purpose because he wanted to bully me a little bit. And I think he did a really good job at that, I'll admit. But I'm fucking dying at that point. I'm like, come on, dog. Jesus Christ. Uh, my goal, anytime I go in the media, what is my goal? My goal is to get as many talking points out there as possible. I'm trying to deploy talking points. Straight up. I think that's what the most important thing is. There is not a lot of Palestinian voices that get to be on television, okay? And by that, I don't mean like directly, literally Palestinian voices, but like voices that are pro-Palestine, okay? I did the same thing with the BBC. I did the same thing with peers. When I'm on, when I'm on TV, I'm using that as an opportunity to just say like, listen, I don't care, you're here, whatever. I want to talk about uh, th this this side that rarely ever gets heard and rarely gets coverage uh, from this this massive audience that you have who is completely unfamiliar with me. By the way, it's insane that this fucking interview in two days got 3.1 million views. Hey, let's Still with me. This is the part where I cook them now. I, I think I did a really good job in the second part. This was not live. This was pre-recorded. I mean, we had a live conversation back and forth, but it was pre-recorded and then played live Why on the show. I just play you a clip of something that you said about the... Uh, October 7th terror attacks, and in particular, the attack at the music festival, which killed 260 people. Look at this guy. You know what shouldn't happen? Killing 260 people at a music festival. No, you're right, man. That just happened on its own because, like, bad guys wanted to do bad things. You're right. Dude, if they f subjugated you to a open-air prison your whole f life, you're going to break out eventually when you realize that there is no other way to get out of it. I mean, it sounds to me there, Hassan, that you are in some way saying they had it coming. Were you? 
Um, no, I wouldn't say that they had it coming. I think that uh, Michael Brooks used to say, uh, analysis is not justification. And while obviously civilian casualties and, and horrific barbaric acts that were committed on October 7 are completely unacceptable, uh, the, the important thing to make sure that it never happens again is to analyze what are the conditions as to, as to how it happened to begin with. And I think uh, Ehud Barak is going to be on uh, mm -hmm. in a little bit as well, or maybe he's on before yeah, he is, me. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm almost certain that while he has held the keys to the conversation and held uh, the, the levers of the power in this conversation in many key and critical points, uh, I, I would go so far as to say that he is among many others who also recognize that the Bibi Netanyahu administration is responsible. This is not just my assessment. This is 85% uh, of the uh, Israeli population's assessment at the time. Uh, this is years and years and years of refusing to negotiate with the Palestinian Authority. Take, don't take my word for it. Take no, Bibi no, Netanyahu's listen, I would personal agree, listen, word for it. I would in agree again. In a closed-door conversation with Likud members, he yeah, said listen. that if you want to thwart any kind of Palestinian nation-state, you must do everything you can to only negotiate with Hamas. We control how high the how high the fire goes. He's given cash to Hamas right. by way of Qatar. Uh, there is no bigger fan of Hamas than Bibi Netanyahu, which uh, I hope one day you can maybe uh, interview and then you'll ask him to. No, no, I, I uh, actually did interview uh, him a few months ago and I, and I did actually spell out to him that there have been a lot more Palestinian deaths this year so far up to the point of the interview than Israelis and what he intended to do about it. He said then he didn't believe in collective responsibility. Quite long-winded replies, though. Yeah, you're right. I should have just been like, hey, man, all of these other people, like, I'm literally using examples, knowing full well that these are people that he will criticize personally, okay? Shut the fuck up. I know what I'm doing. Which is now this hot phrase in this whole uh, crisis about whether you would hold all people in Gaza responsible for Hamas. Interesting to see if Wait, when they. Can I well, let me just finish you, my point. Do you, do you if they do, then launch that? a ground invasion. It'd be interesting to see if they keep to that word. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, a defender of what Bibi Netanyahu has been doing in Israel. In the last year, his attack on the credibility and integrity of the Supreme Court, I think it's been a disgrace. And I think it has fractured society in Israel. I also think that it's caused so much social unrest and had such big protests that you could argue it's taken the eye off the ball of the people who should have been defending the border uh, because they've been trying to sort out what's been going on domestically, internally inside Israel. So I think it's a catastrophic failure of intelligence, of security, of defense. Or this, is a classic, this is a classic take where he's like, Trying to say Bibi Netanyahu fucked up. Like, he took my words and I'm trying to make it seem like we're in agreement. Where I want to stress the point that it's not just, it's not just Netanyahu who is responsible. The apartheid is responsible. Anyone who maintains it is responsible. It's not just like, oh, there's political disagreements between uh, Bibi Netanyahu and, and, and Ehud Barak. No. Okay? I will give you that opportunity to shit on him. But I will not let you keep it there. I will not let you keep it there because I know the truth. The truth is that this entire project for 75 years has been a death dealing project. This entire project is responsible. The maintenance of it is violent, which I will get to now. I think it was clear to even normies that he's had his guard up the whole time. Yeah. I. I think it did a pretty good job All of overall. those things. I'd be amazed, frankly, if Netanyahu survives this. So I'm certainly not here to defend him, even if you do view me as a stenographer for his government. Uh, my, my, my question for you, I think, is this. Is that I've had a lot of problems trying to get people on the pro-Palestinian side to separate two things. That you can say, as I believe and you believe, that the Palestinians have been maltreated for decades. That the situation where they are effectively, I mean, I don't even call it an occupation because Israelis aren't in Gaza. They pulled out in 2005, but they still control the ability of Gaza. That is, well, see, let me this is finish. why I call you propaganda. Well, no, 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 I'm just saying the phraseology is confusing to me because the reality is... There's a delay here, Israel too. Israel exercises control Did you guys over notice people that? in Gaza. It allows Did you guys notice that? Like, because he goes, I wouldn't even call it an occupation. That's when I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is why I call you propagandists. But that was literally, like, on my end, that was immediate. On the video, it's, like, way later. 
allows them in and out. It allows them to turn on the tap of water and so on and so on. I get all that. They don't actually live there because they can't live side by side That's with each other. That's why it's called an open air prison. Right. I, I don't That's disagree. That's why they with, call it the disagree. world's largest open yeah, air prison. Yeah, but Hassan, I don't disagree with you. And I've I have pointed this okay. out for a long time as a journalist. So we don't we don't disagree about the appalling plight of Palestinian people. Um, but the issue comes that if you can't separate that ongoing dispute between Israel and Palestine from the absolutely appalling barbarism of October the 7th, which was on a whole different scale to anything we've seen, where 1,400 people, Holocaust survivors, babies in their, in their cribs, you know, young women taken, uh, tortured, abused, shot, beheaded, we, we, it was reported, and so on. If we can't look at that collectively, okay. And with a with a, a general humanity and agreement that that is an absolute atrocity, then there's something wrong with this. And I find that the, the tribalism on both sides is now so toxic and so frenzied that you get people who literally can't. We've had a bunch of actors, right, signing this statement saying they want a ceasefire in Gaza and calling Israel war criminals and so on, but they don't say a word about the Hamas attacks that precipitated this. And I find that but you really agree with hard, them, right? really hard to accept. This is where I cook them. But you, but you, but do you agree with them? If if they had said, for example, that October seven attacks were brutal and and massacres occurred, and then they said everything else that Israel is committing war crimes, would you agree with them? I, well, it, okay. Here's what I would honestly say about that: Is Israel? He would not. That's how you know. That's how you know his ass went sideways on that one not allowed to defend itself from the worst terror attack we've seen since 9-11. Is it not allowed to defend itself it's just odd. after 1,400 people in Israel are butchered in that way? And the question then, if you assume that they are able to defend themselves, as any Pierce, free democratic the, country, that is the then, then the question State becomes... Department line, Hassan, that is the IDF's line, Hassan, that is the line that everyone Hassan, is let me ask channeled. you this. It then becomes a question of how can they defend themselves? If their mission now is to... Come on, dog! The fuck out of here, dude. He's like, Israel has a right to do some defensive war crimes. To get rid of Hamas, a terror organization that's committed one of the worst acts of terror ever seen. If that is their stated aim, mm -hmm. then what they are doing is consistent with that, isn't it? No. Here's why this is actually an abject failure. And this is not just my perspective on the matter. I'm just a you know, dumb idiot uh, with a Twitch stream who, who is live reacting to the news and trying to make sense of everything as it's ongoing. I usually have a policy of not covering breaking news and, and uh, sometimes that policy is violated, but uh, ultimately I am not uh, held up by the same journalistic standards, even though I think I do a much better job than most other news outlets in, uh, in general. So let me just say this really quickly. You said Israel has a right to defend itself. Absolutely zero people think that this is a ridiculous statement. However, how Israel is defending itself is collective punishment. Now, collective punishment in the form of depriving 2.2 million people of electricity, collective punishment in the form of depriving them of, of water, of food, collective punishment of uh, in the form of 51 people dying in the West Bank, where, you know, there is no Hamas in the West Bank, and yet 51 people have died because in the West Bank, settlers that are occupying Palestinian territory in violation of the international law, settlers who are doing an act of colonial terrorism, and this is not my statement on it, this is international law, that are doing horrifying things by simply just existing there and, and maintaining the presence uh, with, a, with an occupying force in the form of IDF, who is ritualistically humiliating Palestinians uh, uh, in, in, a, in a structure that B'Tselem, an Israeli organization, calls the permit regime, where every waking moment of, of uh, Palestinians' lives in the West Bank are absolute hell, where they have no legal recourse. 51 Palestinians have died, and that was before the Ramallah, uh, the, the Ramallah protest that happened last night, and uh, the Israeli forces were uh, opening up with live fire on protesters last night, so who knows what that death toll has become. This is all, this is all a product of Israel being an apartheid state. This is a violent apartheid state. There is no way to be a let, peaceful right, son, apartheid state. Let me ask you this. It is, you this. It is a violence, let it is a violence this, required for its maintenance. Okay, listen. And that violence is frustrating people. I hear that you. That violence I is radicalizing you. people. But here's Hold my, on. I hear as far you. as Israel, as far as, 
it, as far as what Benjamin Netanyahu has done, as far as the war government, what they have done, peers, going into Gaza yeah. and bombing Gaza and killing 3,480 uh, Palestinians so far in Gaza, 1,000 plus children out of all of those casualties, 22 hospitals being bombed, a bakery, the only remaining intact bakery being bombed yesterday. Um, these are these are horrifying crimes mm. that you would openly say are horrifying and unjustifiable when Russia does it, but when Israel does it, it Israel has a right to defend itself. This is identical to the same talking points that I've heard from every Israeli administration official. It's the same talking points that I've heard from American politicians championing the, the exact same talking points. It's the same thing that I've heard from everyone else in the media. You might have been against... This, I think, was a slow burn. A lot of people will say, Hassan, like, why didn't you hit him fast? Why didn't you jab? It's because instead of immediately being like, here's why you're a fucking propagandist, I think it's better for him to say something that I can just point to that immediately let it, lets it simmer and ultimately gets to a point where it gets to a boiling point where I can point to that and be like, dude, I just described these conditions to you. You act like you care about these people. And then you turn around and say the same shit that Israel says. That's propaganda. Okay. Now, the reason why I didn't do that fast, the reason why I didn't start off with that is because if I do that, uh, I mean, one, because I'm ADHD and I'm hyper-focusing on all the wrong things. The other reason is because I want to make sure that, like, the conversation keeps going without him just, like, because he has all control. He can do whatever the fuck he wants with this interview. So I wanted to hit it hard at the end. Why? Because if he gave me breathing room, I cared more about making sure everybody understands what the situation is, okay? That's why I wanted to just like over and over again, repeat the conditions on the ground. These are things that people do not hear. If I had jabbed him first, who knows if I, he'd let me go off for this long. But I think ultimately, the interview was supposed to be about whether or not Pierce is a propagandist. That's the real reason why he had me on, right? To be like, oh, you called me a baboon in a suit and a propagandist. Well, there it is. I wanted to max out on as many uh, uh, gruesome conditions of Palestinians uh, right now that you're not aware of points to, to bring up while also simultaneously tying it up with a fucking nice little bow at the end and sending that package his way to be like, this is how you're, our, this is how you're a propagandist. Against the Iraq uh, war, and, and you use that, but you're using that for, for evil, in my opinion, at this point. If you are not sitting here and condemning those acts of war crimes, those acts of violence, the, those acts of collective punishment. Well, I would say to that, that I think the death of any child in this conflict is horrific, absolutely horrific. But the question comes down to me, that after an act of terror, as we saw on October the 7th, Israel should be able to defend itself and should be able to go after the people that perpetrated that, who live amongst civilians in, in Gaza deliberately. And the question for me becomes down to what is proportionate? I the question is, the IDF lives among civilians. The IDF literally has mandatory conscription, like everyone has to serve. The IDF's main headquarters are inside of a fucking mall in Tel Aviv. If Hamas dropped the fucking nuke there, everyone would know what's what. That is unacceptable. If Hamas did that, everyone would say, that's the most unacceptable thing that anyone's ever done. Of course, and it would be. It would be fucking gruesome. It would be ridiculous, it would be ruthless. It's crazy. There's so many angles to cover on this like proportionate, what's proportionate, what's proportionate. Obviously, it's disproportionate. Obviously, it's unacceptable, okay? It's ridiculous. But you know what? You know, there's a, you know why this is like ultimately in the hands of Israel? Because they have the power. They have the power. They have the power to shut off the fucking food and the water and the electricity. And they also have the power to not do that. They have the power to consistently occupy Gaza and, and have this like incredibly stringent blockade that stops people in Gaza, 2.2 million of them, from like getting access to regular amenities and food, calling that, calling that in a monstrous way, in my opinion, putting the Palestinians on a diet. Instead of doing all that, they could just not do that and work towards a peaceful negotiation. 
recognize that the Palestinians are human beings that deserve a, a, a life, that deserve dignity, that, des that have dreams just like you do. It's fucking ridiculous to obscure every single person living in Gaza by consistently saying, well, you know, they're all Hamas, they're all Hamas, they're all Hamas, they're all Hamas. It's fucking ridiculous. And I didn't end it there. I gave you also uh, my own perspective on how to end this, okay? Uh, and here, this is important. I don't know the answer to that. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what that answer I is. I do know the answer to that. I do know the answer to that. Last night I had uh, Dr. Ofer Kassif, uh, an Israeli Knesset member who was expelled, uh, suspended for 45 days for saying uh, what I believe is the truth. Uh, what uh, is championing the exact same position of the ha uh, the Haaretz's uh, editorial board. Um, there are a lot of thoughtful people, a lot of um, uh, formative Holocaust scholars, a lot of historians uh, that all agree on the same point. The reason why violence that even penetrates through the Israeli security blanket that, that people thought existed, that penetrated through that Iron Dome, the Iron Wall, if you want to call it that, is because of years and years of oppression and years and years of violence, which is a necessity to maintain an apartheid state. And this has to stop. There's only two ways out of this. Either you engage in full-blown ethnic cleansing, and if you, if you listen to the likes of Smotrich or if you listen to the likes of Itamar ben Givir and these very unfavorable, unpopular, far-right figures, if you listen to Netanyahu and his Likud government, uh, they say that they are interested in going in that direction, the ethnic cleansing direction, the ethnic displacement direction, or the only way out of this for a real solution is to, to move towards peace, to genuinely have to genuinely end the blockade, to end the apartheid, to end the occupation, and create a pathway towards citizenship for all people with a right to return for uh, all 14 million Palestinians, uh, uh, 5 million of which live under Israeli occupation. It's brutal. And then the rest living in diaspora. These are not unreasonable requests. These are requests that understand the dignity and the humanity of one you. side and does not simply treat them as their uh, their colonial subjects. Son, I, and, and it's the only way to create okay, permanent I, security listen. and prosperity in the region. If it was as simple as that. Yeah, I hear you, but it's not simple. It's like, no, it is. It is not complicated at all. It's that simple. Yeah, you can't be like, but sorry, we can't do it because... Why? Because, like, Israelis are, are uh, not interested in that. Why? Because Palestinians are not interested in that. First of all, you don't know. You don't know what they're interested in. You can look throughout time. At different points in time, the Palestinian understanding of a two-state solution was infinitely more popular. It was. Only over time has this notion that it is impossible to have a two-state solution has become a permanent fixture in Palestinian lives as a consequence of the permanent occupation. Because they look to that peaceful coexistence in the West Bank and they fucking see what that means. That means a, a permanent security apparatus constantly up their fucking asses, ritualistically humiliating them at checkpoints, robbing them of their humanity on a daily fucking basis. Why, how could they? How could they ever believe that Israel is going to uh, legitimately uh, uh, move towards a two-state solution? After that, he also <laughs> asked Ehud Barak uh, the proportionate response question, apparently. And he, he might have went uh, mask off here. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at what he had to say, too. For the record, I was supposed to go after Ehud Barak. And then... I was lied to. They bait and switched my ass. I was like, damn, I'm about to go after Ehud Barak. I got some fucking questions for the big homie here. Anyway. He, I love that at the end he's like, oh, you peaceful dove. You do not know that at the top of the hour there's a three minute ad break. You simply do not know. It's more complicated than that. Here's a three minute ad break now, okay? That, I'm sure that would have happened already. I would say this. I agree with a lot of what... It's so dumb. Oh, well, hey, good solution, man. It would have happened if it could have. Like, get the fuck out of here. No, it wouldn't have. 
Every single Israeli government official has literally utilized the two-state solution as a way to cons consistently expand in the Palestinian territory. What are we doing? What are we doing here? Are we blind to the reality? What the fuck's up? They, they always use Hamas, too, as a reason. It's like, even before Hamas, man. Was Hamas around in 1948? Was it Hamas in 1967? 73? Where the fuck was Hamas then? Hamas hasn't been around for all that long and wasn't even violent, uh, violent in, his, in its inception either. As we covered the history of what it is. It's always been a fucking Islamist fundamentalist group, but not popular. Wonder why it, it, it maintained popular, it gained popularity. Wonder how that happened. If you want to take away Hamas and his and its power, you have to starve it. And the only way to starve it of its power is by letting people breathe. That's it. What you've just said, not all of it, a lot of it. I don't think you can ever achieve peace now with Hamas controlling Gaza. I don't think you can achieve peace with Netanyahu in charge of Israel, actually, after this. I don't think his own people will want him to be in charge of Israel down the line when they examine exactly how this happened. But we will see. Uh, but Hassan, I've got to leave it there. It, look, it's good to talk to you. You know, you're an important, influential voice to a lot of people. Um, and I, I think we have a lot of common ground. And there are some things that we disagree. No, we don't. Agree about. But I suspect it's not as much as you think. You know, I do think that the core problem here has got to get resolved in a way that's been completely ignored for decades. And until it gets resolved, until the plight of the Palestinian people. This is why journalism is so silly. Like, people being like, I'm just a journalist is so fucking stupid. Because it's like... It's like, bro, you just said it's simply impossible. And you asked the question about what is proportional? What is a proportional response? Well, at that point, it's like, you're not really leaving anything out on the table, are you? You're basically saying, Palestinians need to suck it, okay? And that, you know, there is no peaceful solution. And the only alternative, like I mentioned, is, is you know, ethnic cleansing. as the final solution. And it's ridiculous to me that he's just doing that while also claiming that he's neutral on the subject. He's like, oh, I want it. I want it so bad. I want there to be liberation so bad for the Palestinians, but also it would have happened if it would, if it could. Well, it didn't.